John, it's <laughs> such a pleasure uh, to do this with you. So we are here in the Hong Kong uh, Movement Disorder Society meeting in 2018, and it's a real pleasure for me. Uh, I'm Kailash Bhatia, and I'm one of the colleagues uh, and friends of John Rothwell, <laughs> Professor Rothwell here uh, from Queen Square. And it's my great pleasure to uh, interview John um, and ask him a few details about his life. And uh, So I have a little performa here, but we might sort of digress if needed. Uh, but at least yes, in the beginning, John, I'm going to ask <laughs> you some things which they have suggested to me. Right. Um, so in, in fact, this is a good question. Uh, I, I've always wanted to know a, uh, an answer to this. So I've known you for so many years, but I've never actually found out uh, <laughs> how you became interested in neuroscience. Or And tell us a little bit about the early years of your life, your education, and how did you get into this field of neuroscience where you are yeah. now so well established and well known? Well, it's a very good question, isn't it? Where we find ourselves in our life, how do we ever get there? <laughs> and of course, you never plan anything. So I came from, I was born in, the, so I'm talking about the 50s and 60s, and uh, I was born in a cotton town near Manchester uh, at a time when all the cotton mills were actually closing down, so it was a bit depressing really. Anyway, I went to the local grammar school uh, and had good teachers, and then I went to Cambridge. And there, of course, in those days, I don't know whether it, I think it's different now. I think students, I certainly had no idea what to do. Uh, my mother wanted me to be a doctor, and the, because she wanted me to be a doctor, of course I didn't want to be a doctor. So <laughs> I did something completely different, which was natural sciences. Uh, without thinking, what do you do at the end of that? It was just a wonderful experience. Um, where, where did you do that? Which, which at Cambridge. Was, at Cambridge. At Cambridge. So it was there that I got interested in neurophysiology because before that it could have been anything. It was biochemistry, it could have been physiology, it could have been anything. Um, and it was my tutor, I think, who first made me interested in neurophysiology. And this was Pat Merton. Yes. So Pat. Pat yes used to work with David Martin and he was fairly old even then when I was a student and we used to have supervisions so at, at Cambridge you'd have an hour and there'd be two students with, with your t t supervisor and Merton used to be the supervisor for physiology and he always gave us a glass of sherry to begin with <laughs> <laughs> because the, the supervisions were always in the evening and I remember him on one very early occasion, it was me and my colleague there, completely fresh from school, knew nothing, and this is our physiology, first physiology tutorial, and he, uh, he looked at us and he looked at the light and he said, um, how, how fast do you think the electrons are going in that filament bulb? Oh, right now. And so we spent the next hour trying to figure out what the answer was. You know, because you think it's quite fast when you flick the switch, it goes, Thump. but you can work it out. And, you know, in this sort of Socratic manner, he got us to figure out how do you do it? Well, you can work out how many amps are going through the wire and how many coulombs, and that's so many million electrons. And you can work out how fast it travels. And believe me, it's slow. <laughs> they actually bump into each other, so they don't actually move very fast. And that was our first supervision. I thought that was wonderful. And it was, it's only recently that I've understood why he asked us that, because that's a bit like how nerve impulses get along the nerve, banging, bang thing along. But he didn't tell us that at the time. Um, so, you know, it's things like that. And also he was, he was one of the few guys at the time who actually did experiments on humans, on himself, which I thought was great because I was useless at doing animal experiments 
and I don't really like killing animals and so on. Um, and they always died when I, <laughs> when I did my experiments. So uh, I thought, this is it, this is the thing to do, I'll do this. <laughs> and that's where you met David? Well, not immediately, because uh, at the end of the three years, and it was only at about finals time, I, I, I thought, well, I've got to do something after this. Yeah, what should I do? <laughs> so, so, so I guess Merton was one of your earlier role models, as you point out. Yes. And did David then follow soon? Well, he or? did, yes. So I asked Merton, what should I do? I said, can I, can I do a PhD with you? And he said, no, I'm too old. Go and see some of my friends. And one of his friends he sent me to was David. And I thought, this is a nice chap. Um, I'll, uh, I'll ask him. So I wrote him a letter like you did you know, in those days and put it in the post and <laughs> waited for the reply. Uh, and he sent a, a nice thing back that said, yes, that'd be, that'd be nice, but we haven't got any money for you. And this was around finals time, so, but, you know, perhaps we'll get some. <clears throat> and you could start in September. That was it. And in those days, it's hard to believe now, the MRC used to give out PhD studentships to people, and they'd all gone b before I decided what on earth I was going to do. So he didn't have one of those. But in those days, uh, they used to have some returned. Some people didn't take them. Didn't take them. And they used to redistribute these at the end. And so David must have applied for one of these, and I got one of those. And so, <laughs> that's, <laughs> and so that's how I That's I how that journey started. Yeah. So I moved down to London, and there we are, began. So in London, however, at that time, it was King's. It was at King's in Campbell. At Denmark yes. Hill. Yeah. And there was mm -hmm. the MRC. Was that the MRC centre, or was that a No, no, that was just David's own, uh, uh, own set of labs. Mm -hmm. that they. It's a nice new building, it was at the time, and it was, from physiological terms, it was full of the most expensive. I realised now, I didn't at the time, most expensive kit there was. It was, it was an Aladdin's cave of really well fitted out stuff, amazing amplifiers, so many of them. And even a computer, a PDP-12 computer that could average and all the wonderful things that were only just coming out then. So at that time when, when you joined up with David, did you have an idea of what you were going to be doing or? No. no. I don't think he had an idea <laughs> either. <laughs> <laughs> so it was just me initially and then Mickey Traub who was a neurologist and we basically used to play on this this set of stuff that was could do anything and I was thinking about it earlier when I was sat here and I, I, I only just realised that it was very odd in a way because we weren't, we were there in Denmark Hill. It wasn't in a university department. So there wasn't anybody around telling us what to do. And David was never there. He was always, you know, he was always doing his patients and bought more interesting things. There was no one to tell us anything. We, could, we knew nothing. And there was, which was nice because you could, we just did anything we wanted. There wasn't someone around it who was old, saying, oh, you can't do that, or you can't do this, or this is the way you do it. We just did whatever we wanted. Fantastic. <laughs> For three years, nearly. <laughs> and, and, and I think <laughs> then David moved to Queen Square, and he took you along. Yes, yeah, so that was in 1987, so I was there from 1976. So Mark Hallett had been there the year before, and there was no one to do the physiology. And so we did uh, quite a lot at Denmark Hill. So all the stuff that we did on myoclonus and ticks, beginnings of the stuff on dystonia. Um, uh, we did a diaphragmatic man patient. We did orthostatic tremor. We did all sorts of fantastic things. I remember orthostatic tremor because it was described in the literature, I think earlier in the year, and David had found a patient that he thought had orthostatic tremor. And they're very funny, you know, because you can't see very much. And so 
patient. He, and what he used to do, he used to send the patient straight to us from his clinic without any ethics or anything. Like that. So what, what can you find out? Those were the days. Those were the days. <laughs> and we used to, and, we, and so with this particular patient, you know, I don't know, and just put the electrodes on and you could see immediately you had this bizarre 16 hertz tremor. And we thought, have we got it going half speed, you know? Is it, is it <laughs> <laughs> are we counting? Are we count the thing? No. Of course, I mean, the 16 hertz tremor is never seen. It was bizarre. It was amazing just to play like that. <laughs> so that's what we did that's for fa that's so long. That's a fantastic introduction, um, which actually brings me to the next point here. Um, what do you feel is your most significant <laughs> contribution? Of it's a difficult question. Yeah, well, that is so a difficult question. Perhaps what you could tell us is how you evolved and what took your interest and what do you think then led yes, to I any think major contributions? It's, it's you very think? difficult. Um, I think when at the time, in the, in the 70s and the 60s, there really wasn't much what we'd call central neurophysiology. So all the neurophysiology was peripheral nerve. There was EEG, but in those days EEG came out on paper and it wasn't used as a research tool at all. And in the mid-70s, people at last began, began to get into the brain to look at physiology there. They could do it because you could average the EEG and you could look at evoked potentials. Uh, and you can see giant evoked potentials in the myoclonus patients. And we, we got those too. You know? <laughs> we got the myoclonus patients. Yeah, that's fast. fast. Wow, what is this? Um, so it was that, and then there was what David and Merton worked on for a long time, which was long latency stretch reflexes. So we used to have reflexes through the spinal cord, and you can look at the physiology there. But this was the first one that seemed to go through the brain. So that was another tool. Uh, and then there was brain stimulation. So all these things came in around that, and I think I was one of the really lucky people at the beginning where we began to use all these tools and there's a whole area of sort of central neurophysiology of the brain that sprung from it. Uh, absolutely, that's... Uh, and there were lots of people who used to come in... Oh, we had, the work most, we had a string of the most amazing people. Uh, we had Jose Obeso, we had Rainer Benica, <laughs> Philip Thompson, oh, they, oh everybody. Everybody came. They yeah. were all fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah. There were these famous uh, were there stories about these meetings in the pub <laughs> in the evening. Is that That's is that true. There was a pub nearby the lab in Camberwell called the uh, Phoenix and Firkin. And it uh, was in the old railway station. Uh, and it brewed its own beer. And it had beer mats that David used to write the instructions on, <laughs> so we wouldn't forget them the next day. <laughs> so those uh, tr tr stories are true then? Those are all true, actually, all true. So again, if you sort of think of this long career you had, uh, in the central uh -huh. physiology and neurophysiology, you mentioned that. Um, and I, I, am I wrong in saying that TMS mm. and its evolution, particularly both for diagnosis but perhaps even to modulate brain yeah. activity, would be one of your major Yeah, that's, that's one of the main technical things that we did in London. Because again, we were the f one of the first people to get one of these machines. Um, they brought it down to Sheff from Sheffield. Uh, Merton said, stimulate my brain and it stimulated his brain and that was in 1985. No and ethics. <laughs> no ethics and Merton rang me up and he said you've got to go to Queen's, Queen's Square now. Uh, so I did, I got on the 68 bus and had my brain stimulated there and then uh, and the next day David came down to me and said order one of those stimulators from them. <laughs> <laughs> 
just said, do it. And I didn't know what the hell to do. Because <laughs> I, 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 I thought, what about money? Are they going to ask me about money? <laughs> so I rang them up and they, they said, yeah, okay, we'll make, make one. And um, so they sent one down. So, yeah, so me and Brian Day and Phil Thompson, we did all the initial work, you know, a lot, and, and Kerry Mills um, and the team at Queen Square we had another one and they did lots of the other basic work. And so the two groups between us had done most of the basics about TMS before anyone else had got one, <laughs> which was wonderful. <laughs> because before then we used to use Merton's technique of electric brain stimulation which uses a very high voltage, mm -hmm. rather uncomfortable pulse of electricity through electrodes on the head. Um, so having a magnetic stimulator was brilliant. Mm. Yes, and so we played a lot with that. So one of the things, I mean, all of us face are obviously, you know, scientific challenges. Um, so if I'm not to ask you what would be the great scientific challenges you had in your career, um, what would you say? <laughs> challenges. Um, this is difficult. Um, I'm not one of those people who, when I find something difficult, keeps at it forever. I usually give up and do something else <laughs> <laughs> and then hope that I'll be able to surprise the question from behind at some future time <laughs> and try and, instead of knocking it head on. So I don't do that sort of thing. Um, I suppose there hasn't been very many. One of the most difficult things actually that we had to do, that's me and Brian really, um, was to convince people how we thought TMS was activating the motor cortex. So there was, if you think about stimulating the motor cortex, the most, the obvious thing you stimulate is the big corticospinal neurons that come out of it and go to the body. And that's the obvious thing, but magnetic stimulation doesn't do the obvious thing. And so it took us a long time to try and prove this. But it's quite very important because it activates the synapse in the brain. And so you can say, oh, I'm actually stimulating and I know I'm looking at this synaptic connection in the brain. Um, and that was, people disagreed with that. <laughs> and that was a bit difficult to, to prove, but I think we did it in the end. At least people seem to agree now. <laughs> the TMS and uh, central neurophysiology is more or less uh, now sort of accepted and as a major tool in studying uh, the nervous system. Where do you think the field is headed in, in this regard? Do you, do you think there are more hmm. advances to come? Do you think, where, where do you think uh, we, we are going with? with physiology yes. and movement disorders well, in particular? I, yeah, I mean, I think as you know, neurophysiology is not as exciting in movement disorders as it used to be, because it used to be <coughs> one of the few tools we had to understand what was going on in the brain. Uh, it's still useful, as you know, we still use it in mm. some peculiar sorts of dystonia, just mm. to give a clue as to what and where mm -hmm. might be going on in the brain. So it still has that sort of usefulness <coughs> there. Um, and there may be usefulness in, in understanding how other therapies work as well, like DBS perhaps. Um, but at the moment, neurophysiology needs, I think it needs a new technique to come along, um, or a refinement perhaps of what we've got. If you could, for example, stimulate deep structures in the brain, or record from them, <laughs> non-invasively, mm -hmm. without electrodes. Uh, it would be wonderful. Is there something on the anvil? You think? Well, the, the pulsed ultrasound stimulation, which can be used for lesioning, as you know, can also stimulate neurons. So there is a possibility, uh, if if it's proven safe, 
that you'll be able to use ultrasound and focus it on, you know, st substantia nigra or <laughs> wherever you want, and stimulate mm -hmm. and see what happens. And that would be quite neat. There'd be so much you could do with it uh, that people would be happy for years. Obviously, seeing your success, um, a lot of young doctors and scientists who are entering the field would wish to emulate you. Um, <laughs> what would the, be the advice, advice you would give to be somebody advice. like this <laughs> <laughs> uh, who <coughs> wants to enter the field of movement disorders and hmm. be the new John Rothwell? Well, uh, I think it's the same advice as anyone. Would, would give in it, it generally, which is just keep your eyes open and notice things. And that's, n that's the rule number one. Um, and rule number two is enjoy it. I think that's, that's very good advice. Um, if you could wind the clock back 20 years would oh, wouldn't that be wonderful? <laughs> <laughs> but would you do anything differently, you think? <coughs> would I do anything differently? Um, maybe. The, we, um, I think for a long time, we, we wasted quite a lot of time doing repetitive brain stimulation. And people do a lot of repetitive brain <laughs> stimulation now. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but we didn't know what we were doing and we still don't and so I think we went into this field a bit fast so you go into it thinking oh I can stimulate the brain repetitively and you know what the physiology should be because you've seen it all done in animals and so you can do the same thing and you think you get the same answer as in animals and if you, you know you too quickly go down the line of thinking oh this is all done and dusted and everything looks fine but it's not because it doesn't always do what you expect it to do. Uh, it's not reproducible. And when you wind back, you realise, oh, heck, actually, we, we're not quite sure what we're doing because we don't quite know what we're stimulating. It's a mixture of rather nasty stuff, um, and you get peculiar answers. Um, and we should have gone a lot more carefully, in a way. But you just get excited by the times, you know. So that, that would be something you'd do differently. Yeah. Yeah. This is a... a, a I, I know that you... Uh, I've seen you go swimming uh, <laughs> as you're <laughs> quite as regularly. Do, yeah. So what do you think is required to achieve a <laughs> work-life balance? Apart from the swimming. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you think you have a good? Do you have a good work-life balance? And at the moment, I think it's absolutely brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I really do. Um, I think to achieve this, well, at least for me, the the important thing is I have to go home and see my wife, and then make sure the kids are all right and they they're doing well. And once you're into that, then all the other stuff is. Immaterial. Immaterial, really. <laughs> Unnecessary or irrelevant. Yeah. So you think that you have a good work-life balance? At the moment, at the moment I at think least. it's yeah. Uh, yeah. Pretty, pretty good. Uh, I don't have a lot of responsibilities now. I'm not head of department. I'm not anything like that. So that's, that's the best thing. Mm -hmm. Get rid of responsibilities and just enjoy what you're doing. What kind of role has the Parkinson's Disease and Movement Disorder Society played in the field, and particularly in your area? Do you think they've they have been useful to you, or, uh, or you to them? Or <laughs> <laughs> so? Yes, I think I think especially early on in the eight, at the beginning in the eighties, nineties, it was very useful as a shop window for the sort of neurophysiology I was doing and that got it 
seen throughout the world really on the back of the movement disorder movement um, so yes I think from that point of view it got a lot of people mm. interested and t uh, allowed them to see what was possible yeah. is there a, a forum for the uh, neurophysiologists here in the Women's Disorder Society well not as such no when I think about mm. it perhaps that's something we should thought Can about before really yeah <laughs> Yeah, you think it, it may be. Yeah. Um, yeah. Did, did did you experience any bias or barriers when you were earlier in your career? No, no. no. I'm, a, I'm a white middle class male, <laughs> <laughs> brought up in those times. No, no barriers whatsoever. I I always remember. You know, I went to Cambridge mm. to a all male college at the time. These days, my chances of getting in are fifty percent less <laughs> because it's half women. <laughs> so no, no I, I, you had, didn't have any barriers. You were, you were no, no. Well, David was was fantastic, of course. Yeah, he looked after he his looked own after people as well, didn't he? He looked after you. Yeah, uh, without being anything pushy about mm. it, mm. Uh, it was just making sure everything was fine. That jobs that salary came and so on. I, I know that you're close to retirement and do you have any plans to, <laughs> are you going to be just <laughs> quietly drifting away or you will keep uh, your hand in the till? I suppose, I, I'm always going to be interested aren't I, it's, and especially in, in brain stimulation area. Um, so yes, no doubt I'll be one of the irritating old people who goes around telling people not to do it this way. <laughs> <laughs> and don't you remember that so and so did this 35 years ago? It's not new. <laughs> so you're going to be around to heckle people. Absolutely. <laughs> who are doing this. Yeah. Is there anything else you'd like to add, John? Any, any no, I, I, I think I've had a, a very, very lucky life because things I haven't had obstacles and I had a great boss who looked after me for years and people have been nice to me ever since I mean what what can I say <laughs> that's terrific Good. thank you very much John and uh, it was thank a real you, pleasure to uh, <laughs> chat with you today and thank you thank you